Hello, this is Dr. Dan Baker, and welcome to this video overview of the derivation of the velocity and acceleration equations for particles in tangent normal uh, coordinate system. So let's think about the fact that we have different coordinate systems, and maybe you're from more familiar with your Cartesian coordinate system, which is an XY coordinate system. We also have particle-based coordinate systems. So it turns out that our tangent normal coordinate system which we'll often abbreviate T-N, is a particle-based coordinate system, which essentially means that as a particle moves along a path, let's go ahead and add a path here to our drawing, say a path looking something like this, that as this particle moves from here in location one up here to location two, it turns out that its axis system moves along with it. And so if we draw the axis system, the tangent normal axis system for point one, we know that tangent is always going to be uh, in the direction of the motion. It turns out we could draw right on top of this line here. This would be my velocity vector and that lines up perfectly. 100% of the velocity is in the direction of tangent. And then the normal goes toward the local center of curvature. And so my normal axis is going to be perpendicular to my tangential axis. Uh, now there's not going to be any velocity in the normal direction. It turns out we will need some acceleration as we get to that point uh, in that direction as well. So let's say that our center of curvature, kind of our origin point coming straight out this arm in here, uh, is right up at this point. And so we could draw here that there's going to be a radius. Now this radius will use rho versus r. The reason we use rho is because this is a radius of curvature as opposed to the radius of an arc or a circle. Uh, and we could do a second position vector over here to number two, and let's call this rho prime. Okay, so the terms associated with two, you could call this row one and row two. We're going to use row and row prime. So all the prime terms will be associated um, with the velocities happening here at point two. And so we could have a second velocity here, call this v prime. Okay, so a velocity at one, a v, a changing velocity both in direction and magnitude possibly um, at two. So a couple other things to add to this diagram. One of those are unit vectors. So you might recall that in XY coordinate systems, we had unit vectors we called I hat and J hat. Here in tangent normal, we're gonna have unit vectors. This one's gonna be called um, U sub T hat. So my unit vector in the T direction, still putting a, a hat above there to remind us that it is a unit vector. Once again, this is my new um, tangential axes, so we could call this we wanted to t prime, and then we have a unit vector along t prime, which we could call um, u sub t hat prime. Okay, so my new unit vector um, at point two versus my unit vector here at point one. We could additionally add in the unit vectors. Uh, in the normal direction. So this would be my unit vector at point one hat, and then here would be my unit vector at point two, so u sub n hat prime. All right, that gives us pretty much all the different pieces we need. Um, we will also uh, look at this change in angle. I mentioned that we're making an assumption here that one and two are fundamentally quite close together. So we're gonna use this as a differential angle. So we'll call this D beta. Okay, so a change in the angular position beta, basically that um, length or radius of curvature as it um, shoots over in this arc. So as we think about this movement of one axis system to another, it turns out that once again, we have changes in the magnitude of velocity. We also have changes in the direction of that velocity. Um, and so let's think about how those changes relate. Okay, so if I just extract this unit vector and this unit vector, and I think about the change between those two, it turns out that I can draw these. So here would be, I'll blow these up a little bit. So here will be my u hat sub t, so my tangential um, unit vector. And then additionally, here would be the second one, my u hat sub t prime. 
And not only do the radius of curvatures change this angle delta beta, but it turns out that we could go through the geometric proof to show that this is also the angle delta beta. Now, because these are unit vectors, the lengths will not change, right? Unit vectors are defined as having a length of one. If this d beta angle is quite small, it turns out that we could close this as a triangle and write this term here as the change of the unit vector in the t direction. Um, so d u hat sub t. And if this d beta is quite small, um, then this would turn out to approximate a right triangle. Okay, so if this approximates a right triangle, uh, we basically can say then um, a couple of uh, cases here. So we can say that if d beta is small, right? And so small basically means like approaching zero. We can say three different, or sorry, two different things. One of those is that the change in my u hat sub t is perpendicular to my unit vector in the t direction, okay, as indicated by this right triangle. Now, I realize as I drew this, I probably drew a little larger d beta than I needed. Um, but once again, if we assume that this basically goes to zero, really, really small, then this will always be perpendicular. And the second thing that we can state if that angle is quite small is that the length of this change, this d u hat sub t, can be described by the arc length. Now, some of you may be saying, okay, I think I've heard of the arc length, but I'm really not quite sure. Uh, can you refresh my memory? Uh, sure, let's take a look at the arc length. So if we have a circle, so in this circle, let's say that we have um, an arc described by, so here would be a radius. We'll use the same uh, labeling here. So radius, we'll use rho versus r. And let's say that we just want to find out um, this arc length right here. Okay, so if we describe this angle as d beta, then we could describe this arc length, this curved arc length, as ds, okay, using s as a distance value. Um, and so if we take a look at this, if we have a radius, um, an angle, and an arc length, it turns out that our equation for this arc length would tell us that ds is equal to rho times d beta, essentially the radius times the angle, as long as this angle is always in radians. It has to be in radians. If it's in degrees, this relationship will not work. Okay, so using that relationship, we then can come back over to our little description here, length of du um, hat sub t can be described by the arc length. Let's put it in, in terms of these pieces. So we can say that this change in the unit vector, which is my d u hat sub t, which is the arc length described by a radius of, so we'll put a row here. Um, so that's going to be the radius of the unit vector. I think we know where that's headed. That's going to head to 1. And then we would have um, the angle d beta. Now the last thing we're missing in this vector relationship turns out to be we're missing the direction, right? So if we have a unit vector, unit vectors are a vector. There's a magnitude and a direction. And so this direction is perpendicular to the unit vector of the tangent axes. And so isn't perpendicular to the tangent axes always the normal axes? So it turns out that we could write this in the direction of u hat sub n. And then let me also make put a little substitution in here. If we're talking about unit vectors, unit vectors have a length of 1. So therefore, that is 1 times d beta times the unit vector in the n direction. 
Now, the last thing that we'll do with this relationship, like this works fine, this gives us the change in that unit vector length. Um, later on in this example, um, we'll need this not just as a change in length, but a change in length with respect to time. And so what I'm going to do on both sides here is I'm going to divide them by dt, basically taking the time rate of change of both sides of this function. So we can rewrite this equation as um, my unit vector in the t hat, sorry, in the, the unit vector in the tangent direction. I'm going to put a dot above here, the time rate of change of that unit vector is equal to, okay, so the time rate of change d beta dt, we can also write using dot notation as beta dot. And then the direction of this is still described here by the u hat sub n. So we can put that term in here, u hat sub n. Okay, so the time rate of change of the unit vector in the t direction is equal to the time rate of change of the angle beta in the normal direction. Okay, so let's go ahead and we'll hold on to this. We'll use this a little bit later in our derivation. I'm going to call this equation one. Um, equation two, I'm going to come back over here to my arc length equation and perform a really similar change. And so I'm going to divide both sides here, basically take the time rate of change of both sides um, of this equation. And we will end up with uh, the time rate of change of the position s, right, going back to our one-dimensional motion, one-dimensional kinematics. This is going to be the velocity. So the velocity of this particle moving around the curve is equal to, uh, the radius will stay the same. The radius, because we're talking about here a circular arc, so the radius isn't changing over time. So this will just be the radius rho, but then we'll have this d beta dt, so the time rate of change of that angle beta. Okay, so this will be another equation, and it turns out we're going to use um, a generalized equation like this um, a lot in dynamics. Uh, I'm going to call this equation 2, also noting that the, the very parallel equation to this that you may have seen before is that the velocity is equal to r times omega, where r is the radius, of, uh, not a radius of curvature, but a radius out to a location of a particle. And then the omega is the same thing fundamentally as beta dot. It is the angular velocity, right? The time rate of change of angular position is the angular velocity. All right, so there are those two equations. So the reason that we needed to use these um, is as we come down now to find the tangent normal components of our velocity vector and our acceleration vector. So we can start with the fundamental relationship that the velocity is equal to ds dt. It doesn't matter what axis system we use, one dimensions, two dimensions, three dimensions, that's always true. And then we can do the substitution with uh, equation number two up here and see that this is also equal to our rho times beta dot, the time rate of change um, of the angular position. And so therefore, we can write that our velocity vector um, is purely in the tangential direction, right? So if I want to write this as a vector term, so on the left is a scalar, on the right over here will be a vector. I could write this as rho times beta dot in the u hat sub t. I could also simply write this as the, the speed, right? The speed being the magnitude of the velocity. So the magnitude of the speed um, in this tangential direction. So I put that in... Um, unit vector form would look like this, or in bracket form, we could write that the velocity is equal to either the rho times beta dot, all in the tangent direction, nothing in the normal, or we could also write this um, in terms of just the velocity itself, so the velocity with nothing in the normal direction, right? Just reminding ourselves that the first term is always the tangent, the second term in my notation will always be the normal, so tangent and normal. All right, so that turns out to be actually the easier of the two derivations, easier of the two talking about the velocity and the acceleration. The acceleration term 
comes from the velocity. It's still going to be the time rate of change um, of this velocity relationship. So let's take a look at that. We'll scroll this up. So now looking at uh, scalar equation, acceleration is equal to our dv dt. And wouldn't it be nice if this worked great and we didn't have to worry about the time rate of change of the angular position. But it turns out for the acceleration, if we are talking about two-dimensional motion, there's not really a scalar version of that. The scalar version really would be talking about the time rate of change of the magnitude, but we do need to lump in the time rate of change of the direction as well. And so if we rewrite the velocity now as a product of the magnitude and the direction, so we have a d dt, and then the product here, once again, the velocity, that's the magnitude, and then the direction is the u hat sub t. So let me just label these here. This is my magnitude, and this is my direction. Now when we go to take a time derivative, we need to think about the product rule, right? We have these two different terms multiply times each other, and we're taking a time derivative of those. And so taking the product rule, we end up with that the acceleration as a vector is equal to, so we'll take the derivative of the first times the second, so that will be, we'll put this here as a dv dt times my second term, which is my u hat sub t, so that's my unit vector in the tangent direction, and I'm going to add to that my first term, which is my velocity. Now this is not the velocity vector, right, because this is the magnitude piece of the velocity. And then I'm going to have the time rate of change of my um, unit vector, right? So this would be my u hat sub t dot. Now noting that another way I could write this if I wanted to is u hat sub t dt. Just to remind us, all dots in dynamics are time rate of change. Um, so dots essentially just put a dt below and you'd have the same relationship. All right, so now this time rate of change of the unit vector. Now, had we not gone through all the mental gymnastics a little higher in our page, that might seem like a really mysterious term, but it turns out that here we have it, that the time rate of change of that unit vector in the tangent direction happens to be equal to the time rate of change of beta in the normal direction. Okay, so coming back down on my page, I can do a substitution, and this substitution tells me that, once again, this was equal to my beta dot in the u hat sub n direction. Another thing that I can note is that dv dt, time rate of change of the magnitude of the velocity is always going to be the tangential acceleration, okay, a sub t. So tangential, time rate of change of the magnitude, normal, time rate of change of the direction. And we'll see that play out here as I wrap up this equation. So we can write that our acceleration as a vector is equal to, uh, I'll go ahead and write this in bracket form, so our a sub t, tangential acceleration, and then in the normal direction, we have the velocity times beta dot. So those would be our two components. Once again, tangent on the left, normal on the right. Now, by doing some substitution, okay, revisiting this equation I labeled up here number two, that velocity is equal to rho times beta dot, it turns out that I can um, do various substitutions in this normal term to come up with some equivalent forms. And so it's three different equivalent forms. The second equivalent form, um, when we just need to carry down our tangential, there's no change there. That's just the tangential is the only one way to describe it. Um, but by doing a substitution, we can end up that the normal is also equal to the velocity squared divided by rho. And then finally, the last equivalent form is that it is additionally equal to beta dot squared times rho. Okay, so those three different forms are all completely valid 
for our normal acceleration. So you can use any of them that are convenient. The reality of these three forms is that this form here gets used most for particles. I would say 95% of the time, we can use v squared over rho for our normal acceleration for a particle. And for rigid bodies, it's actually going to be that beta dot squared times rho, which as you'll see happen uh, later in our dynamics book, this often looks like omega squared times r. Noting that the time rate of change of the angular position is the angular velocity. And so beta dot squared and omega squared are analogous terms. And then rho is just a radius. So this is the term we end up using for rigid bodies. But any of the three will work. There are going to be maybe a handful of problems. Possibly you're given a beta dot for a particle and the velocity. So you could use the top one. But commonly v squared over rho uh, for particles and beta dot squared over rho for rigid bodies. So just to wrap this up with a couple of these definitions um, typed out in words, our tangential acceleration, a sub t, is the time rate of change of the velocity magnitude. Okay, the magnitude and the magnitude alone. Another way you can think about the tangential acceleration, it is the rate at which an object is speeding up or slowing down. Yeah, in driving a vehicle, you could think that the tangential acceleration is the rate at which your speedometer is either increasing or decreasing, right? That's measuring the speed of your vehicle. Normal acceleration is the time rate of change of a velocity direction. Uh, we only need change of velocity direction if something's moving in a curve. If something's moving in a straight line, it turns out the normal acceleration is equal to zero. Uh, and then we'd only have tangential acceleration up and down that straight line. Another way you can think of the normal acceleration is the acceleration needed to keep an object moving in a circle. Now some of you may have heard of the centripetal acceleration in physics. We tend to use the word normal versus centripetal in dynamics, but if you remember centripetal means center seeking. Okay, so normal accelerations are centripetal accelerations seeking the center, holding uh, a particle in a curved path. Thanks for listening today. I hope this was helpful.